Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Saturday morning live stream here at the Garden Like a Viking headquarters in northern Indiana, zone 5B6A. And it is a beautiful sunny day. We got a break in the cloud cover, only a few chemtrails above us at the moment, which is great. Uh, and spring is on its way, my friends. So, Let's see, uh, bring your questions. We got seed starting going on. We've got uh, planning happening. Uh, you guys are trying to plan what you're gonna grow this year and why. And uh, this is the year of food security, okay? Actually, every year is kind of like that, especially uh, our ancestors. It's been like that for a long time. So food security is number one. And when we uh, think of what crops to grow, we have to first ask ourselves, okay, what is the, my source of calories? Okay, a lot of people wanna grow a lot of what I call rabbit food, and that's great, but uh, at the same time, we need the things that, call, that uh, give us calories. The potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the beans, the corn, the peas, uh, all of that kind of stuff. The beets, the carrots, that's what we wanna focus on. Also the leafy greens, but there's a lot, you know, you can't survive just on kale. So Val, hello my friend. She says, good morning from cold northern Arizona. What's cold for you? Hmm? Uh, let's see, Rhonda Williams says, okay, I have my lab. How do I incorporate it into my diet? Do you have a video showing ways to use it in your food? Uh, the best way to incorporate it into your diet, in my experience, is to, well, one, eat the cheese. The cheese is filled with the probiotics. That's why it only lasts four or five days in the fridge. And uh, so a little bit of sea salt, maybe a little bit of dill or thyme or oregano or something like that. Maybe um, a fermented tomato. Eat the lab's cheese with the fermented tomato, you guys. That is phenomenal, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but you can also, if you just have the liquid, you can also take it just, you know, uh, internally, like a shot. You can take about, mm, uh, I've done about a, an ounce before in a glass of water and you just drink it like that. That might be a little much. Uh, for some people, you know, but it's going to have all the good probiotics in it. So you can put it in any kind of food that you want. That's all going to work. So, uh, but the best way is to consume the cheese. And then the the labs is for your plants. Um, so uh, Lukash says, I mix it with some juice or kombucha. Howdy, y'all. Okay, yeah. So he mixes it with some juice or some kombucha, which would be great. Uh, you can also incorporate it into your diet by way of fermenting other stuff. So the labs is a fantastic uh, starter for your ferments. So if you've got something that isn't typically like the best of fermenters, like cucumbers or even uh, tomatoes uh, or many other things, other vegetables, you can make your brine, put it into the container, and then add a shot, an ounce of the labs. And that will ensure that it's the lactic acid bacteria that cultures the substance before the spoilage bacteria because that's all we're really after we want the lactic acid bacteria which is the lactobacilli it's a certain set of microorganisms we want them to digest the food uh, and colonize the uh, food first before the spoilage stuff does because when the lactic acid digests it their byproduct when the lactobacilli digest it the byproduct of that is uh, an acid basically in which nothing else really can survive so once they've colonized the, the food, the sauerkraut, the kimchi, the fermented tomatoes, the pickles, the brine, whatever it is, the peppers, the smoked poblano fermented hot sauce, yes. Once they've colonized that, it's pretty much shelf stable. I mean, nothing else is going to really be able to live in that environment. So Rhonda says, I have my lab in the fridge right now. Do I make sure it is room temp before I add it? What I am, what I am fermenting? And what would you recommend for a first ferment? Uh, no, room temperature doesn't matter. So, you, I mean, you don't have to make it go to room temperature. Keep it in the fridge. That'll keep the labs the most active uh, or the most, you know, it'll lull them to sleep so that they don't over consume their environment. But uh, first ferment, what do you guys think? What, what do you think are ones really easy to ferment? So tell Rhonda what you, what you would recommend. I would recommend sauerkraut. Start with the fermented cabbage first because it's very easy. It wants to just ferment itself. And so uh, watch the video that I've made on the fermented cabbage. That works really well. Also the fermented tomatoes. I mean, those are just like incredible, but it's not really tomato season right now. So yeah, you could go to the store and get a cabbage and ferment that with some caraway seeds and some juniper berries. 
Uh, Jeremy says, good morning all. Checking in from San Diego. Can't believe it's Saturday again so soon. I know, man. The days, the years are just flying by at this point in life. Just, just uh, yeah. Especially since I got this sauna and the ice bath now, and I've having people coming over all the time. Now, pretty much every night, uh, during, you know, there's people coming over, and we're doing the breathing exercises, and then we'll go into the sauna, uh, and then we'll go into the ice bath, and back into the sauna, into the ice bath. Man, the sauna has been the missing link, because for four years, well, the previous three years, I've been doing the cold training, but no sauna. And so it was like, you're just always cold. It was like real daunting. Nobody wanted to come over and, and do it. But now that the sauna's here, everybody wants to come over. It's just a game changer. It gets super hot and super cold, super hot. I don't even notice it's winter time. I'm not missing the growing season. Cause you know, most of you guys get like, if you're like me, it's like, oh man, six months where we can't grow anything. Everything looks dead outside and all of... not this year, not at all. I'm patiently or anxiously awaiting the season, but uh, I don't mind the cold at all. Cause it's my friend. So, uh, let's see. Joe says your cabbage and tomato ferment videos are fantastic. Thank you. That's, that's what I would recommend too, to her. Ms. T. Hello. Good to see you again, my friend. She says, Hola, Nate and mind likers. I like that term. Uh, can't stay. I'm at work, but just wanted to drop off some high vibrations and strong, positive energy. I got my cut organic ginger on the counter. We'll be planting it Monday. All right. Well, thank you for stopping by my friend. I am uh, glad that you're growing the ginger this year. It's going to be a really fantastic experience for you. Good thing you're starting early. And I think you're a bit in the south, so you're going to have no problem growing it. Hello, Taida. And uh, Sweeping Page says, fermented carrot sticks worked really well for me. Carrot sticks, okay, yes. Uh, how much of the lab do I add to a quart of food to ferment? Well, you will see in the video, if you watch my, my Preserving the Harvest videos, you will see that we make a brine and that's most important. So you make the brine, you add all of that, and then about one ounce to a quart to a liter is going to about one shot, give or take, is going to do it. That's going to do it. Colonize it first with the lactic acid. Uh, Marcus says, can you make labs with brown rice? Uh, yes. Yes, you can, because we're only capturing the microorganisms and a little bit of the starches off of the rice. Hmm. I'm not 100%, actually. I, I'm not 100%. I think you can, but uh, I don't know for 100% because I've always just had white rice. And all throughout the world, they just have white rice, pretty much. I mean, all, all the, the countries, most of the world actually eats rice for every meal. I mean, population-wise, most of the world eats rice. And uh, it's always white. It's always white rice. And that's what has been for a long, long time. So um, I'm not super convinced with the, uh, with the whole philosophy that brown rice is even any better at all for us than the white rice. They've been eating, these Asian cultures know what they're doing. They've been eating white rice for thousands of years and they are m much healthier than Americans typically. So, uh, and my experience has been with white rice, it's so easy to digest and it's so energy giving, but it doesn't cause any issues, you know, so. That's my rant about that. Rune Master, hello my friend. He says, hey Nate, any tips for starting cabbages from seed? Uh, never done it before. More or less same zone as you, 5B, okay. Uh, so in place or are trays cool? Timing? Yes, so cabbages, you can start from seed, definitely. Uh, soil blocks are really good for those. If it's your first time though, I just recommend the solo cups or something similar. Do the solo cup method and put poke the holes in the bottom. Uh, and with the budget seed starting setup that I made the um, the video about, then you should have everything that you need: the heat mat and the uh, the light. Now you don't for brassicas you don't absolutely need a heat mat, but it's still. I keep my house at like 55 at night and 62 during the day. So uh, in the basement it's like 50, 48 even or 50. So I, you have to use a heat mat because nothing is going to germinate in that, at that temperature, really. Not vigorously. So uh, if ideally, get the heat mat, put it at 75. Even for the brassicas, they like a good 75. It, it will speed their germination dramatically. Uh, as opposed to, it will take three times longer if you don't have a heat mat. Or, and then they won't be as vigorous. But yeah, do the, um, so plant the seed about, uh, let's see here. 
they grow really fast. So you actually, okay, if you start it eight weeks before your last frost, then cabbages you can plant out two to four weeks before your final frost. Cabbages can take a, a light frost, no problem. So can kale, so all, all the brassicas can take a light frost. So you can plant them out, I mean, depending. Some of you in, further north, you still got snow right up until the, the last frost and stuff. So, uh, but get a feel for the weather and stuff. And if it's not gonna drop below like 25, 22 degrees Fahrenheit, if you don't foresee it dropping below 22 degrees Fahrenheit, then you can plant out your brassicas. Your, your uh, even 20, you know, with a little bit of protection. But uh, then you can plant out the seedling. And they only need about six weeks. If you've got the heat mat going, because you asked me about starting cabbages. So if you've got the heat mat going uh, and light, and you've got good soil uh, with some nutrients and all of that, then your cabbages will sprout fast. And six weeks is really all that they will need. And then you can plant them outside and uh, they're good to go, okay? And yes, you can direct sow them as well, some people do, but I'm not into like thinning, I'm a terrible thinner. How many of you are terrible thinners like me? I just can't, you're just pulling up all these super healthy baby plants, it just, it's tough for me. So uh, I like to just plant in soil blocks or the solo cups, one, boom, seed. Uh, and then also, well, we'll get into that later. So let's see, uh, Jeremy says, I accidentally propagated 93 grape cuttings. When I pruned my grape plants, I placed the cuttings in with my leaf mold pile, forgetting they will grow. Wow, and they, that's, they've started to grow from that, huh? Joe Peduzzi says, hello, Nate. Do you think fertilizing plants with JLF, water-soluble nutrients, regularly will cause the plants to stop feeding the soil microbes because they're already getting what they need from the JLF. No, no it will not because the, um, we are adding microbes during this process. When we're adding the JLF, it's also a microbial brew at the same time. And even they are not directly in the form that the plant can utilize. And so we still are feeding the soil food web and allowing a more diverse and plentiful spectrum of microorganisms. And that is what is it, that's what it's all about. So we have to have our base fertilizer and our additional fertilizer. The base fertilizer, most important, okay? And this is gonna, I'm gonna get to a question from Scott from the, the Bushcraft uh, channel about his sterile seed mix, okay? So that'll tie into this, but we want to have our base fertilizer first, and that is what the um, roots will draw from. So no amount of additional stuff that we add can possibly uh, replace the base fertilizer. What is in the soil, what the roots are absorbing, uh, and, and what the microorganisms are breaking down, okay? So that's most important. Then we supplement. So the base fertilizers is manures, compost, uh, leaf mold, and things like that many number of things on this channel and uh then we will uh supplement with the additional fertilizers and that's just like a topping off that's just making sure that all well-rounded nutrients are there okay it's not at all like if we use chemical fertilizers because it, it, it your question is if adding the fertilizers is going to interrupt the the plant microbial soil microbe relationship and using these fertilizers, absolutely not. It does the opposite. It bolsters the soil microorganisms, which is what it's all about. Everything is about the, mic the biology, okay? But if we, are, if we are part of the industrial ag system of thought where we are farming with chemistry and not biology, then we will say, okay, well, we'll add our, our, our fertilizers and they focus on N, P, and K, and that's, that's it. And so um, if we use those kind of things that are chemically Alt created in a laboratory to already be in a form that can be absorbed by the plant and then it active it bypasses the whole soil food web it doesn't it doesn't do anything except starve the soil food web and it, it uh, actively kills them through the irritation of the salts so if we're using chemical fertilizers yes absolutely if you're adding these fertilizers it will starve and deplete and disrupt the, the uh, relationship between the soil microorganisms and the plant roots, definitely. So for that reason, we never use that kind of stuff. There's just no need for it. Nature never uses it, and she's survived for millions and billions of years. 
and, uh, and is the ultimate OG sustainable grower. Okay. So we have to mimic what she does. So, uh, let's see here. Um, Green little plant. Okay. Can I combine several of the principles you've shown? Okay. Inquisitive Mister says, can I combine several of the principles you've shown in one fertilizer ferment and get effective results? For example, fish, urine, weeds, calcium, lab, etc. Basically making a comprehensive plant food, adding finished products to one container, not fermenting together. Though that would that be more effective? Um, now we can do that, except the urine and the uh, fish and the mm, calcium. Uh, yeah, see, they're, they're so they're specific. So uh, definitely not the labs. We don't add the labs to any of our ferments except for the fish hydrolysate, the fast fish fertilizer. We don't add the labs because we don't want the labs is only one tiny. Well, it's big, but it's still a small um, uh, spectrum of microorganisms. And so we want the widest diversity of microorganisms possible. And so we use the leaf mold and we ferment it in that method. So adding the labs is going to uh, alter that. We add the labs only at the point of use, like right before we are about to apply it to the plants or the soil. That is when we add the labs. But yeah, you, you can put the things, mostly if you, if you want to make one barrel, um, you see, if you have so much fish and stuff, fish is really good for the, the leafy growth of the early season and stuff. And up until about halfway into the season, but once they start producing fruits and things like that, I, I tend to lay off of the things that are generally more heavy in the nitrogen sort of growth promoting factors. That would be the fish and the urine. You know, those are really for about vigorous, dark, leafy growth, more or less. Um, and so they're still balanced. But we don't need that later into the season. We want the fruits to start uh, finishing. We don't want the plant to, to continue focusing on uh, vegetative growth because of this overabundance of nitrogen-rich sort of fertilizers. So for that reason, we will stop with the fish and stuff and the urine uh, once the fruits really start to set and stuff. And then we will switch to the ash fertilizer and then with the... Um, calcium fertilizer and the calcium and the, the potash, the, the potassium uh, from the ash and stuff like that is going to really help the fruits to become more colorful and hard and store a lot longer. So see with, with those kind of, uh, it gives us so many more options when we keep them separated. Uh, if you just combine everything all at once, it's not, it's not going to function as well. Now you can combine everything as far as the crops you're growing. If you have the crop residue fertilizer, like you'll see, I made a video. I made a video. If you only make one fertilizer, make it this one. That one, we combine everything. But all we're combining is the different crops that we're growing, so that we get a, a complete nutrition for whatever crops it is that we're growing. But we still. But that's just vegetative matter. We're not combining fish with that. We're not putting urine in that. We're not putting ashes in that. None of that other stuff because uh, that would really limit our application capabilities. And so for that reason, we can combine all of the vegetative plants, but we don't combine the other stuff. So that's a long answer for that. And uh, David says, Nate, I've been thinking about starting a like-minded gardening living community for old farts like me. After a couple of adult beverages I came up with, I soiled my plants. Guys, what do you think? I soiled my plants. A retirement gardening community yeah uh, I would come to I soiled my plants and do seminars anytime so let me know and that is also my dream actually to create a community of like-minded people with a school uh, on a number of acres out west and so that we can uh, teach these things to the younger generations and because they will come to the farm and they will see that it is actively putting into practice and fully sustained by all of these principles. And then we will have uh, courses and all kinds of stuff where people can come and learn to make these fertilizers themselves. They will learn how to, uh, and then maybe some of the extended stay people, they'll be there for a couple of months, you know, helping on the farm. They, I will teach them how to read the plants, how to observe the plants, and the plant will tell you everything it needs to know, that it needs. Everything you need to know, the plant will tell you. How to read the soil, how to, there's so much to it, of just observing and all of this hands-on stuff. 
So yes, that's, that is my vision. Uh, hello, Mish. Good to see you, my friend. She says, hi, Nate. When do I pull my crazy sweet potato slips and put them into cups of water? They're getting huge and very numerous. Yeah, guys, Mish sent me some pictures of her sweet potatoes and they are beautiful. So she is utilizing the water method uh, that I made a video about last year. Still a very good method. Okay. I'm going to show you another method here in a couple weeks, but if you want to get, if, if you want to get started early, go ahead and do the, uh, the water method, it's still really good. But see, the reason, one of the reasons that hers looks so good is because she has that heat mat on there. And most people will start them and just put them into a window. And that's kind of what I used to recommend. But uh, last year I put them on a heat mat and then I saw hers, she put them on a heat mat. They're way more vigorous, okay? And uh, her temperature was 89 degrees Fahrenheit on that heat mat. So sweet potatoes are heat loving, they love the heat. And so uh, if you're gonna start them up that way, put them onto the heat mat. She also has a good, uh, a nice high powered LED light. So they're getting plenty of light. And that's making that real thick uh, uh, stalk and real short internodal spacing, you know, or short distance in between uh, leaf nodes. That's, those are all good signs. Now, your question was, when do I take them off and put them into the cup of water? Now that's gonna depend on when you want to plant. They only need about 10 days in that cup of water uh, at the most because they will, they will, especially if you're keeping them on that heat map, then only about a week to 10 days. They only need to sprout out some additional uh, roots. But if you pull them off and they've got all kinds of roots on them, which yours may very well do that, if you can pull them off with the roots, then you can plant them directly, actually. Uh, so or you can just peel them and put them into the, uh, the water to sort of recover. And when you put them in the water, you'll see that they'll sprout new, fresh, bright white roots. So wait till those are about a half inch long, okay? Which will just be not long, or maybe an inch long, the, the fresh, new, bright white roots. Uh, and then plant them out and keep them very, very moist. Keep them very moist for the first couple of weeks of their life. That's important. But then after that, see, sweet potatoes are the kind of thing you plant the slips, because remember, we, we can't, you don't plant sweet potatoes and get more sweet potatoes. Uh, but you, uh, what is this person? I saw, looks like a, huh, some kind of a bizarre uh, spam. Yeah, so you don't plant sweet potatoes and get more sweet potatoes. You grow the slips, and then you plant the slips. Now, they take a number of weeks. They will just sit there for uh, weeks, what looks like a month, probably. And uh, they'll just sit there, not really doing much. And then you will uh, see that they will explode and they will just boom and they'll grow inches every day. And before you know it, you'll have to be trimming the vines. So uh, I like to keep the vines trimmed to about four feet because they'll just want to grow, 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 grow. They'll grow 20 feet. But you don't need them focusing all that effort and energy on the vegetative growth. So uh, I like to keep them trimmed to about four feet long. And that helps them focus their energy on the um, tuber production. Atmosphere says, afternoon, Nate, a regular part of my Saturday now. All right. Uh, let's see here. Rise above the di stigma. Di uh, I guess it is. I would think it's just a conversation. Okay. What are you talking about? I don't really understand this uh, comment. Yeah, automatic released hip hop songs. But anyways, uh, let's see here. And D. Wright, good morning. Wanted to make goat poo tea in five gallon bucket. What ratios of poo to water should I use? How long until it can be used and what dilution ratio should I use when applying to plants? Okay, so uh, goat is very much like rabbit and, and alpaca and those kind of things in the sense that it's very benign. So you can use it pretty much straight away. You can incorporate it into the soil or if you want to make a tea with it, do a, uh, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. So if you're going to make it, if you're going to, so let's say you had a five gallon bucket, you could fill it um, a fifth of the way full and then f with the, the manure and then fill it the rest of the way with water and let it sit for a while, agitate it a bit, and then you could water directly with that undiluted. You know, or even one, uh, then you could dilute that. Or you could do, you could do like half a bucket, 
um, the bucket half full of uh, manure and then the rest of the way with water. And uh, that's gonna be a lot more concentrated. So then you could take that concentrate and pour that and dilute that one to 10, one to 20, whatever it is that you want. So the more concentrated you make it, you would just have to dilute it in the application. But if you wanna make it if you, so that you can water it straight away, I'd say a fifth of the bucket or even like an eighth of the bucket with manure, the rest of the way with water, yes. Uh, let's see. We're building a school and it'll be very volatile. Okay, hey, have you tried looking into shipping crate building? Because you might actually like fast forward to building your school and it'll be very vital to the community and the world. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, yes, when I was in California, we had a number of shipping container um, things that we had and they're very good for some things, yes. Uh, but with this, it's all about the land. I just need to find the land first, you know, in the right circumstance and all of that that uh, because the actual way that we're gonna build the dwellings is part of it, okay? It's going to, where they're gonna be built in such a way that eliminates heating and cooling costs for the most part. A Little bit of wood stove uh, stuff, but yes, they will be, um, it's all here, it's all here. So, okay. Uh, Mish says, since my grow lights are powerful, should I use humidity domes on seedling? soil blocks so they stay moist on the surface while they germinate. Uh, it depends on what the ambient humidity is. It's not so much the light as it is as it would be the um, humidity. So if it's getting really dry in there, maybe, but domes can be really tricky. And that's why I don't recommend domes. Um, because, wait, did somebody give a uh, donation here? Uh, that's why I don't recommend domes because they can stifle the airflow and so that makes it so that uh, they uh, mold. Mold and mildews will come in, okay? And we don't want that to happen. So that's why I typically don't recommend using uh, those. But if it's super dry, then yes, you can. Oh. Okay, Miss KC, I had to go way back up here. $1.99, thank you very much, my friend. Happy Saturday, everyone. Yes, happy Saturday to you. Good to see you here again. First tip of the day, I appreciate you. Um, let's see, Mikola Mulek says, how should fish emulsion fertilizer look? Uh, it will look gnarly. I mean, it can look very gnarly. It doesn't matter. Once you put the right ingredients inside the bucket, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's gonna look, have all different kinds of molds and fungus and all different kinds of weird stuff. But uh, it doesn't matter, it's all part of it. So it should be, it should be thick though. It should be getting thick, that's what you want. So Rune Master, awesome. Thanks for the tips. Your onion starting method worked really well for me. So appreciate your advice. And yes, terrible thinner too. It hurts. Yes. Oh yes, I know. Okay. And um, Reed says, ah, good to see you here, Reed. Uh, he says, hi, Nate. I'm trying to get my sweet potato to sprout in a clear plastic container with wet peat. Should I keep it covered or leave the top off a bit? Should I worry about mold? You should uh, not cover it. So peat is, yeah, uh, th that'll, that'll work. You just wanna make sure it doesn't get hardened up. But yeah, keep the peat nice and wet. Do not cover it, because that will uh, create all kinds of molds. And uh, you'll see in the, in the method, I'm gonna show you guys here pretty soon, that uh, I bury that sweet potato about eight inches deep. So you shouldn't have any issues with anything drying out. That thing will push will push um, sprouts all the way up through eight inches of soil, no problem. I know, it's incredible. And so uh, that just makes stronger, healthier transplants with more root zones, or with more roots nodes already on them, okay? So uh, let's see. Lease to own, come back to Cali, we miss you, bro. Yeah, oh man, Northern Cali, I would love to do that. And I've been looking at land out there and stuff, and, and since the collapse of the industry, you know what I'm talking about? The whole reason I was out there, the uh, since the collapse of that, now you can get 80, in Humboldt, right in Southern Humboldt, where I was, uh, you can get 80 acres with a stream, a creek running through it year round, with two springs on it, okay? Uh, about 45 minutes from Garberville, and uh, for 300 grand. Now, that's 80 acres with creeks and stream. 
or with a creek and two, two uh, springs. So that is exactly what I would be looking for, something like that. Don't need any buildings, I just need the land, the raw timber, the material, the water, and the climate, which Southern Humble, Humble, all of Humble is ideal climate. Uh, and then I would build the things. But 300 grand, man, when five, eight years ago, that would have gone for 900 grand, or, or it would have been not even available. But uh, things are changing there, yes. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Mikola says, but is it good if kept in a low temperature? Because I live in Poland, and even in my garage, there is like 53 Fahrenheit. Uh, are you talking about, what were you talking about, Mikola? I forget. Um, uh, the Was it for the fish fertilizer or what? Yeah, remind me again what you were talking about, Mikola. Mish says, not sure I want to grow Jerusalem artichokes. Looks like I can get them on Etsy. How many would I need for J. Dom made with Jerusalem artichokes? Uh, if you're super limited on space, you know, you don't need to. But if you want to make the, the pretty much the good pesticide, then uh, the Jerusalem artichoke, if you did, if the, you can grow a lot of them in a small space. So if you just had one space that was like a square meter, you'd be able to grow enough. <clears throat> if you had like five or seven tubers you know and you planted those and they would all grow and they'll grow like six feet tall and then at the end of the season you'll take the whole entire all of it uh, and save some of the tubers leave some of the tubers but uh then you will make the pesticide with that so you could get plenty in a square meter a square yard <clears throat> yes thank you jeremy he says nate is looking to help us out let's help him out by hitting that like button yes my friends remember to hit the like button and uh let's see okay about the fish emulsion Mikola. yes you uh <clears throat> it'll be okay just leave it outside or, or leave it in the garage it doesn't matter it, it will just take longer to break down the cooler it is the longer it'll take to break down but then i assume that when the summertime comes it warms up it's more than 53 even in poland so yes uh you you can uh, uh, put it into the garage. Not a problem. Marcus says, we just bought another 10 acre for 80K after the fires in Butte area. Septic power house pad. Oh, nice. Yeah, see, that's already hooked up. Nice. Does, did it, can, uh, did it uh, connect to your current uh, place? Let's see here. Man, there must be some kind of a... Yeah, this, this is the very first time that I've seen that we would need a moderator because if somebody is just posting all kinds of real pointless things that I can't see. Mish, $50, my friend. Thank you very much. I appreciate you greatly. Uh, the second tip of the day. Thank you. And uh, I wish you continued success with your um, setup. It looks like you're right on track. So, yes. Let's see. Is it okay to plant in 100% compost? Sorry if this is a dumb question. Yes, you can plant in 100% compost. Uh, what? Seedlings? Startups? Uh, in Potted stuff? What? Because remember, compost is not soil. So it's, uh, it's on its way to being soil, but it's still a long way away from being soil. Uh, it's very, very good additive. You, you still typically will want actual some actual soil. But if you're talking about seed starting, then yes. Just sift it or make sure it's totally finished. And yes, you can do the compost. You just have to be aware that things will be hatching out of it. Things will be hatching. So if you have a greenhouse, that's not a problem. If you're talking about doing stuff inside in your grow tent and you're using pure compost, you will have stuff hatching. You will have stuff flying around. That's just the nature of it, okay? So um, you have to be aware of that. So, yes, it's correct to our current 40 acre. We actually closed our previous 250K contract when it was on it when it burned. Oh, okay. Nice. Current 40 menu. So you got 50 acres now? Nice, man. That would be real nice. Uh, Han says, what about urea? Can it be enhanced? What do you mean enhanced? And urea, the way that we make the fertilizer, the urea fertilizer, as I showed you to digest it with the leaf mold and stuff. Yes. Val says, going to buy chickens. Any suggestions for layers for a first-time chick buyer? Guys, help Val out. I know there's a lot of you guys with chickens and stuff. Uh, I 
was a part of raising chickens. You know, we had, we had chickens always in California, but I was not the one like picking out the breeds and stuff like that. So I know how to care for them and everything, but I don't know how to, the differences between the breeds, not yet. As soon as I get the land, of course, then we will start that journey and all of that stuff will come out. But, um, yeah, Rhode Island Reds are very steady layers. Mick says Rhode Island Reds. Uh, Rhonda says, would you recommend using humus in your seed starting soil or in your raised gardens? Yes, humus is good. Um, now, are you talking about like humic acid, which is made from a, like a Leonardite, which is made from a type of um, um, coal? It's made from a type of coal. So yeah, it can be good. But, uh, man, okay. There's these two guys, the can among goat and this, yeah, they're really blowing up the chat with just a bunch of nonsense. So this may be the time that I will have to say, okay, we, I need some kind of moderation. I don't know how to, uh, make some of us moderators. Okay. Yeah. I will definitely do that from now on. Cause this guy's got to go is, uh, not really conducive to our, what we're doing here, my friend. So if you would please just move on. That would be great, but I doubt it. So, uh, going to buy chicks. Okay. Is it okay? Okay. Yes. It's perfectly fine. And when creating slips, okay. Hey Nate, when creating slips by burying sweet potatoes in cold frames, how many weeks before the last frost date would you recommend to start them? Now it doesn't matter that much actually. Well, I mean it does, but it's, uh, so if you can start them eight weeks, that's, that's good. It typically took a lot longer in the water method, but that's because most of the people aren't heating it. All right. And so, um, and so the, the people aren't heating it. And so it takes a lot longer. So typically like 12 weeks with the uh, water method. All right. But you can, uh, start with the soil method and that will, um, it goes a lot faster, especially if you've got a hot frame or something like that, or a cold frame, especially if it's warm, but if they're not, then uh, it's going to be issue. Then it will still take a lot longer. So I would say eight weeks would be enough time because really you don't need them. They can be lo this long. You know, you would just cut it down. So it doesn't really matter if the, if you start them too soon and they just get really long, that doesn't matter because you can actually just make more slips from the long one. Just cut it. So there's about four nodes and stick it into the water. And there you go. Man, I can't imagine this this but being this person right here says that's doing all these comments i just couldn't imagine think of how lame their life must be that they're on someone else's live stream and and interrupting it with all these bizarre pointless things that they're saying and they're sitting there thinking yeah wow man this is cool look what i'm doing man i'm, I'm really messing his stream up yeah <laughs> that must be fun but anyways uh i can still find you guys as uh questions it doesn't really matter but yeah thank you very much for all of the uh suggestions for moderating because that's definitely going to have to happen after this uh, experience. So, hey, first time for everything. You learn. So, let's see. James says, sorry to ask twice, but I'm at work trying to listen. Is chicken manure good going into the compost? Absolutely. Chicken manure is wonderful. Chicken manure is the highest in urea of all the manures. And so, uh, you can put it into the compost. You can also... Um, digest it with the, the liquid fertilizer method. So you can, uh, do the barrel with the, and then you can use it straight away. So you could have uh, liquid fertilizer ready in just a couple of, well, a couple of days actually from the chicken manure, as opposed to having to dilute it for, uh, or digest it for months on end, uh, in the fertilizer method or in the, uh, man, I'm all flustered up, but whatever. So, okay. Hi, I noticed some fungus on top of my compost pile of food waste. Would that be a problem? Should I get rid of it? No, not at all. Shalma Ahad. And I recognize this question from last week. Sorry, I didn't get to it, you know, but there was so many questions and stuff, even without this troll in the comments. So it says, hi. So there's some fungus on top of your compost pile of food waste. Uh, that's not a problem. Once you put stuff into the compost, guys, it's not going to matter what happens. The compost is going to uh, do all sorts of things. There's going to be uh, insects, larvae. There's going to be um, molds and fungus, uh, pink and white and uh, black and all of that. It doesn't matter. Give it, a, give it a stir would be good. So that's what I would do is uh, give it a stir. 
and then everything should be fine. Marcus says, Nate's getting popular. He got bots now. Oh, that's funny. What do you guys think? This is a robot or something? Or what? what is the point? I don't get it. If it's a robot, what is the point? Why are they blowing up the chat with all kinds of nonsensical stuff? What, what are they getting from it? I don't get it. But because I don't know. But anyways, uh, that doesn't really matter because there's bots and trolls in real life all over the place anyways. And I have uh, spent my time deflecting. I have spent my fair share of time dealing with that in real life. And uh, so this is not a problem. What about adding fresh vegetable scraps to a liquid furt? Yes, you can do that. You can continue to add fresh stuff and just skim out the old stuff and it's perfectly fine. So that's really the beauty of it. You can have like a liquid compost pile in a way. So you can just add the liquid stuff and uh, that can, ooh, Austin. That's a great tip. Let's see if it works. Uh, $4.99, thank you very much, my friend. We will see. Okay. And, uh, okay. We'll see. And uh, Hans says, you're spot on, Nate. Don't worry about the bots. Yeah, no, I'm not really worried. It's actually really good training because now it's already a lot of comments, but now there's all these bot comments. So it's like, whew, okay, it's good training for my mind. So I have no problem with it. It's like cold training. It's like any other kind of training. You know, they, Rhonda says, they're just jealous of the fact that you have a lot of followers and they don't or can't get them. Yeah, that's possible. If they're a real person, well, yeah, it would make sense because nobody likes somebody that doesn't add any value to something and just uh, sucks positive energy for no reason whatsoever. Nobody would like that in any form of, li in any um, avenue of your life. You know, nobody likes something like, focus like a Viking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So Alexander, my friend, says, how does goat manure compare to horse manure? Horse manure is uh, stronger than goat manure. It will uh, have a lot more weed seeds in it, though, because the horse does not digest its food nearly as thoroughly as other animals do. Uh, so whatever you're feeding the horse, you will get uh, seeds of that in the manure. But the horse manure is pretty much, along with ox or cow manure, uh, the horse manure is pretty much the oldest form. So it was really good that, um, that we use that, the horse manure. Goat manure is also good if you can get it in the same kind of quantities. I mean, you must have a lot of goats if you can get it. Because horse manure, I, I can go to the, my buddy who's got uh, the uh, stable. He takes really good care of these horses. They're eating real, eating like little princesses and stuff. Real good quality, soft hay. And uh, I can go there and get a whole trailer load of this stuff, no problem. You know, anytime I want. So you'd be hard pressed to get a whole trailer load of goat manure. So I guess that's the thing. Um, Nick Pavlikov, 999. Thank you very much, my friend. Appreciate you. He says, thank you for your time. Yes, you're welcome. And James says, I live in Ohio. What's some good plants to start growing outside right now? Man, guys, y'all hear about what's going on in Ohio? I mean... It's insanity. It's insanity. It's it's such it's so sad that we have become so careless. Even I mean, it is just I just watched the fire burn. I just watched the cloud up in the stratosphere, and I watched the uh, the the film. I've seen I'm seeing videos of films on the water, and I'm seeing it get into the waterways and all of this. And I'm thinking, man, that is just uh, really unfortunate just toxic chemicals burning into the air, dumping into the water as if we don't have enough of that already. So yeah, that's uh, really deeply unfortunate. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Chemical spill in Ohio, uh, very likely the worst natural disaster in US on US soil. Yeah, or not natural, the worst man-made disaster, uh, chemical spill. So, uh, but that, what, what was the question? I'm sorry. I uh, totally didn't. Oh yeah. What's good plants to start growing outside right now? Right now, nothing, nothing. You don't really plant anything right now. You grow them indoors. Now, if you have an area that you can um, heat in some way, if you have a cold frame, it's still too early even for a cold frame. It's the middle of February, man. We are still going to get cold weather. I mean, it's still going to be 10 degrees or colder probably. 
uh, at least for here and there. So, so unless you have an artificially heated space, I wouldn't, there's no need to start anything yet because I'm in Indiana, so we're not far. Um, so I'm not going to remember guys, you really, especially if you have a, a climate like Ohio or Indiana or Illinois, a nice long growing season. And we got a great growing season here, really. Uh, so, and it doesn't get too extreme hot or, or too extreme cold. So, um, we don't have to start stuff super early. We don't gain anything by that. So we, uh, we, it's better if we can just start a little bit, you know, sooner, or I mean, closer to the last frost date, and then we can plant outside. You know, uh, only things that take a long time, like tomatoes and peppers uh, and, and ginger and onions, is it good to really start up, you know, that we really have to start indoors and stuff. But um, yeah, that's, so I wouldn't start anything yet. Let's see. Ben T says elite made disaster. Ain't no accidents and don't blame regular and don't blame regular people either. Gotta say that I agree with that, my friend. I think many of us do. So let us see. Uh, Anita Christomatsis. Are you Greek? Uh, I didn't save any leaf mold in the fall. Can I dig some up from under the snow? Yes, absolutely. The micro, it, it actually, contrary to popular belief, it doesn't matter really what time of year you gather the leaf mold. Uh, it doesn't do anything. They don't go anywhere, really. They just go like dormant. They don't, they can't run or crawl or migrate south or anything. You know, they're microorganisms. So they just stay right there. So um, you don't need to worry about that. You can go and get it right now. Yes. So... Uh, Val says, you inspired me to buy a house plant. Got a healthy pothos from Costco yesterday. Okay. Uh, I put in same room as my seed starts. Is that okay? Or do I risk bugs from the new plant? Um, well examine it, but in my experience, the pothos is totally impervious to insects. The pothos is one of the few plants that just doesn't get, it's just not tasty to aphids or mites or anything like that. I mean, I've got house, I've got plants all over the place. You see? And they are totally, um, uh, they're like everywhere. And they, um, if you watch my houseplant video, you'll know. And not a single insect. Yeah. But they're also very healthy. So that, that's part of it. But uh, yeah, they, they actually, pothos don't, doesn't require that much light. You can actually put the pothos near the window. You know, because the pothos evolved to uh, climb up the trunks of other trees. That's what it does in its natural environment. And so it evolved under a dense jungle canopy. And so it's used to receiving very little light, but it reaches towards the light. So if it sees a little spot in the canopy, it will grow quickly up towards the light. Uh, so that's, that's how you get them big, long vines. If you watch my houseplant video, you'll see mine are like 30 feet long. So, um, Frank says, I want to make the leftover whey from cheese making with six parts water and use all my citrus and other plants. Thoughts? Okay. Leftover whey from cheese making. Well, it depends. Uh, if Are you making it biologically or with the, with the acid? So if you're making it with like rennet or a lemon juice or, or vinegar or something, that is not the same. It's not the same uh, at all. Uh, to the lactic acid bacteria serum because the rennet or the acid method is ke is chemically taking it and forcing it to coagulate really quickly and so it's not it's not happening where when we make the labs it is by biological activity and so that is uh it takes time it takes much more time like five to seven days or three to seven days as opposed to five minutes when you're doing it with the acid method and so uh, that kind if you're making like cheese curds and stuff that, um, I would just put on the compost pile. Yeah. You could water your, your, uh, you could water your citrus with it and stuff, but it's not that it's not bursting with the microorganisms. There's virtually no lactic acid bacteria in that, especially if you're using, uh, pasteurized regular store milk. If you're using raw milk, then yes, go ahead. But even to make those cheese curds, you have to heat it up to the point where it pretty much kills all of that stuff in order to make the curds. So not the same thing, just because I get that question a lot, actually. So um, Becky says, pothos do not like direct light. That's right. They can, they can take direct light though. It, if they're, 
hardened off to it. And then they get super big because I've grown them outside in the soil in the summertime and they get super big leaves uh, when they get some, some direct sunlight. It doesn't like full sun. But like if, it, if it's in like a spot where it can get an hour or two of direct sunlight, they, they will grow really well if they're adapted. But if you take your house plant and put it out there, no. No, it will die. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. A couple of things I wanted to comment on. Yes, Joanne, I wanted to say she is, a, she is a regular contributor to the channel. She says that she lost her job recently. So I'm sending you positive energy, my friend. Thank you for your uh, support over these months. And uh, uh, this is to when one door closes, another door opens. And this has always been true in my life. So I don't know your situation right now, but I'm just saying that um, some of the times in my life when I thought, oh my, how I will never recover from this. This is the worst thing that could happen to me. And this has happened multiple times in my journey. And yet looking back, I would not have it any other way because every single door that closed like that just redirected me to what turned out to be a much greater path. Uh, so that's my experience with that. I say, do not fear my friend. There is always the light. Okay. So I just wanted to say that. And, um, let's see. Lori says, uh, our chickens love labs cheese. Oh, absolutely. It's great for their digestive tract too. Um, it, cultivate life says is JMS the best method to turn crappy soil into rich soil. It's one of the best. So you combine, if you, if you have a plot and you guys will see this when I get the ranch and stuff, we, we will, we will do all of that. How to remediate soil hundred percent. Uh, the best way is a combination of the JMS with a living root in the ground. You have to get living roots into the ground because only a root, a living root, meaning a plant can actually build soil. And they do this by capturing sunlight and then combining the elements and pumping the carbon. They capture carbon out of the atmosphere and pump it into the soil in the forms of starch, uh, sugars and stuff, exudates. And uh, this process of pumping carbon into the soil changes the actual makeup of the soil. It builds the soil. And so that is what we need. And so we will, but also the microorganisms. So um, we need to do both. So we will apply the JMS multiple times in various dilution rates. You know, we, we could go over that. If you ever wanted to do a Zoom meeting, you know, um, we can do that and I can tell you the specifics. But do the JMS and then also the cover crops. You immediately will start planting the cover crops and they will go to work remediating, building the soil, fixing the things. That's the key. So um, let's see, Mackenzie says, you have done essential food videos. What about an essentials chemical ingredients list of things that need to be ordered to make essential J Dom Castile soap recipes? That's not a bad idea, actually. Um, I could do that. Probably should do that. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a. Let me see up here. Uh, where was they? Hmm. I see a five dollars from someone. Where is it from? Okay. Five dollars from Val. Thanks, Nate and friends, for all the chick me uh, suggestions. Ah, you're very welcome, Val. Thank you for the five dollars. Uh, Mick, twenty bucks. Thank you very much, Mick. Appreciate you, my friend. Uh, Got to go back to work. Uh, catch the rest later. Thanks, Nate. Yes, you're very welcome, my friend. Thank you guys so much for the support. I appreciate this. Um, so, yes, Scott from the Bushcraft Channel. He sent me an email and he was talking about, okay, I have made a sterilized seed mixture, okay? Uh, seed starting mixture because he didn't want insects and stuff like that uh, inside. So it's a, like a sterile seed mixture. I, I forget exactly what he said it was made of. I think it's like cocoa coir and perlite or something like this. Uh, so there's no nutrients in it. And now he's asking, he says, okay, but now that the seeds have sprouted, now what should I feed them with? And here we are, guys. This is one of the issues. So we need, uh, nothing can truly replace what goes into the actual soil. So what would be really good is to add a generous amount of worm castings to your um, 
mixture before you make it, okay? And uh, I don't know if you're sterilizing it in an oven, that kind of sterilization, but add the worm castings after that, okay? Because you don't wanna heat sterilize worm castings. Add the worm castings. They've got small amounts of nitrogen and all the good stuff. They've got a well-balanced you know, array of things, plenty for the seedlings. So I would, uh, <clears throat> yes, you can add the worm castings. Also, you can make a worm uh, casting tea and you can fertilize with that. You can, uh, also you can uh, use some of the JLFs. If you have the fish one, use that, but you wanna dilute them big time. When we're using them for uh, um, uh, seeds, then they don't only need a small amount. And we don't want the tray or whatever it is to turn rancid because we just don't have all the power of the soil food web in the indoor setup. So uh, we will utilize the um, JLFs in a much more diluted form. So yes, you can add that. Um, I would stay away from the ash fertilizer um, or, or anything like that. So I, I would utilize, I would stay away from the urine fertilizer for the indoor stuff, just a little bit of the fish, the worm casting tea, and uh, some of the labs as well. Yes, and you're gonna wanna use that often because if you have no nutrients in your seed starting setup, in your seeds um, mixture, then they're gonna need stuff pretty regularly, once or twice a week even, you know, depending on certain things. So um, that's the thing, guys. Uh, you, you have to see that the stuff that we buy from the store, like the miracle Grow soil and all of the, they call them bags of soil. They're not actually soil. Soil is a combination of sand, silt, and clay with microbes, with microorganisms. And uh, these things are pretty much just peat moss and perlite, maybe a couple of other things, but he, he, that's not soil. So it's actually a soilless growing medium. And uh, therefore, we need to add the nutrients because peat moss and perlite doesn't provide any nutrients to the plant, really. So we have to add that, yes. But we don't want to overdo it on the indoor. Okay, do you have a worm farm video? No, I do not, because I don't have a worm farm here, actually. Not like in the kind that we had in California with the, in the big bathtub uh, where we're collecting the juice and stuff. Here, I just worm farm in place. So if I create the environment that is ideal for the worms and they love this. The worms, if you go out into my garden at any point and you lift up just a thick layers of organic matter and rich stuff, you will see worms dangling down. I mean, there are so many worms in that. Red, there's composting worms in it. There's also earthworms. When I go out into the garden at nighttime in the spring, after like a after a light rain, I go out there with a headlamp, and every step I take, just just hundreds and hundreds of of uh, earthworms on the surface, you know, uh, breathing out of their their holes and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's ideal to worm farm in place. They like lots of organic matter, and the favorite food of the worm is leaves. That's right. Uh, Scott Murray, thanks, Dad. Ten dollars. All right. Uh, let's see, you guys are being good today. So, read of Urantia, Nate, how do I best shut down my Sonora winter garden beds before I head back to Vermont? I've grown lettuce, kale, and Swiss chard. Okay, how to best shut them down? If you can get some fertilizer, that would be, or I mean some manure, that would be a good fertilizer. So get some manure and uh, put it thick onto the beds and then add, um, leaves on top of it, leaves or grass clippings. Or if you had to, you could do cardboard or something on top of the manures. Uh, also another good way, except I don't know exactly what would grow there because I don't know specifically how hot and dry it gets. Um, I would say a cover crop, but I don't think a cover crop would thrive without irrigation and stuff where you're at. So I would do it biologically. I would put down lots of manure, uh, layer it a little bit. So manure, leaves on top, add a couple full strength, um, Jadam microbial solutions and um, you should be good to go. So Laura Green, 20 New Zealand dollars. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, so she says, hey, Nate, I have an opportunity to start a half acre plot veg garden with a bunch of people. It's right next to the beach, sheltered by a line of houses, but it's straight sand. Man, that sounds lovely. Uh, grass is growing in it. Uh, advice to kick this off. Okay, so it's straight sand. 
That's gonna be, you're gonna need to add lots of organic matter to that. Sand does not hold moisture or nutrients very well. So the types of grass that are growing there are probably very, very hardy. Rhizome, they grow by rhizomes, I'm, or, I'm sure, by runners. So uh, what I would say is that you need to think about how you're gonna get the organic matter into the soil. Preferably if you could get it, I don't know if, if you're in the, I don't know what part of the country that you're in, but if you could get leaves, like a couple dump truck loads of leaves, leaf mold, uh, that would be really good. Grass clippings, even some wood chips, but nah, that, that'll take a while. Um, so if you could get, you have to get the organic matter in there and incorporate it, okay? Biochar and uh, charge up the biochar. Now those are all things that would do um, good that you'll need to be doing. But first and foremost, you have to get rid of the of the uh, the grass and stuff. So you can tarp the area. That's that's usually a good way. I don't know exactly what kind of plants you have there, but for the most part, a nice tarp uh, will kill all the grass and everything else. So if you put black tarp, even a clear tarp can work, but black tarp is the best because it'll roast them and block the uh, sunlight. And so they will die. Uh, put the tarp onto the plot and um, put uh, weights over it. And after a couple of weeks, depending on the temperature, if the sun is intense enough, then everything will be cooked. And then you can do the organic matter into the soil and um, the leaf mold and stuff like that. So uh, let's see. Oh. So uh, yes, that is what I would do. Does that answer the question? Do you need something more specific? Mm. Let's see, all we have, Reed says, all we have here in the desert is burrow dung. Well, I don't know what burrow dung is, but it doesn't sound plentiful. So you could also then utilize, uh, so you don't have any kind of vegetative matter or plant matter or a livestock farm that you could go to and get a couple loads of manure or, that sounds, that sounds bleak, my friend. What, what are you there for? I mean, I'm joking, but kind of not. So man, I could, I could, oh, donkey dung, okay, burrow dung is donkey dung, okay. If you've got plenty of it, yeah, absolutely use it. If you've got enough of it, definitely. Uh, otherwise, just add a bunch of organic matter. I don't know how much square footage of bed you have. So if you have like a thousand square feet of bed space, that would be different. Um, but <laughs> I thought he said bro dung. <laughs> All we have is the bro dung, yeah. Uh, that's good. Okay, cactus only. Man, cactus, all you have available is cactus and donkey dung. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna have to come, you're gonna have to like uh, develop a different plan. So you're gonna have to go and get some stuff. Or, so you can't grow, obviously you can't grow um, cover crops because like here in the summertime, if I if I left here for a summer, then then I would plant cover crops in all my beds and I would just leave it and they would all grow perfectly fine. They, they might be a little drought stressed maybe, but uh, they would all grow, no problem. But I think there, it won't. It won't grow without irrigation. So you'll have an issue. So uh, yeah, I would focus on getting more organic matter or focus on whatever, um, there's just not really any good cover crops that can, that can take blazing hot, bone dry conditions, you know? Yeah, he says it's rough out here. Blue Wolf says hard to grow in a desert. Right, exactly, yeah. That's uh, like most of Southern California existing in a desert. Uh, let's see here. Someone says something about uh, Rhonda. Maybe check Reed Greening the Desert by Jeff Lawton. Jeff Lawton is a good guy. Yeah. Val says, Nate, my hubby and I watched so many of your vids. We are starting to talk like you. Say the same phrases and especially, okay, my friends. <laughs> I love it. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's uh, it just uh, developed. I, I don't even know how, but yeah. I like to start at the same, you know? Consistency is key. And uh, <clears throat> hello, Nita, good to see you here. Stone Creek says, hi, Nate, I'm very, very late. If you answered already, I apologize. How are your onions? My onions are doing really well, of course. They, uh, I'm growing the yellow of Parma <clears throat> and the um, Australian brown and the uh, Weathersfield Red. <clears throat> I have to take a um, one drop of uh, clove oil because you hear my voice is getting a little bit of uh, 
of a horse. So I'm going to take a drop of doTERRA clove oil. Very, very good, high quality stuff. And uh, <clears throat> yes, oh man, like a soothing, just a wonderful soothing blanket of comfort over my throat with this clove oil. Clove is very good for all that kind of stuff. So, um, <clears throat> my onions are doing really well. They've, they've come up and um, they, uh, now the thing with onions that we're gonna do though is that we have to, and I didn't say this in the video, I'm sorry, but you know, I can't think of everything. It's, I try to, but I didn't say this in the onion video. I keep the onion seedlings trimmed to about five inches. This is important says the first year I just let them grow and grow. And I was like, oh, look how long they are. And they're a foot long and they're flopping over and they didn't transplant well, okay? So, um, and they, they struggled a lot. They just stayed shocked for a long time. So what I do now, the past couple of years, is uh, once, the, once the seedlings reach about six inches, then I'll cut them back to five inches. And they'll reach six or maybe seven inches, I'll cut them back to five inches, like that. And I'll probably prune them three or four times, you know, before uh, planting them outside. And that, that helps them to get thick and stocky. You know, you want them to be thicker because the first year they were all just like pencil lead. I mean, super thin. But then the, uh, after I started trimming them, they, uh, they're more like the actual pencil thickness, you know, nice and much thicker and better. So that's good. Um, Stone Creek says my onions didn't sprout. It's been about 10 days. Did you get fresh seed? That's number one. If onions, they barely last one season. I mean, I mean if you store them perfectly, they can, of course, but you, uh, you want to make sure you get fresh seeds and then you want to make sure that they're about 75 to 80, 83 degrees. Um, Lori, yes, you can eat the onion trimmings. Absolutely. They taste just like chives. Stone Creek. Yes, I bought fresh ones. Okay. What's the temperature? Do you have a heat mat? What's the temperature of the soil? That will dramatically influence the time. If you don't have a heat mat, it may take up to a month for them to sprout. If you do have a heat mat and they're 75 to 83 degrees, then um, you, they should be sprouting anytime. Mine sprouted in five days or so with the heat mat. They're 80 degrees. Uh, room temp is 80 degrees. Okay. Hmm. What's the soil temp? And did you cover them? Did you cover them with some soil? You need to cover them with a little bit of soil. Some people say you don't cover onion seeds. I say absolutely you do. Okay, you cover them with soil. Did you bottom water them? Or is the soil, has it stayed wet enough? And there's airflow? Because um, if all those factors are true, then, and you got fresh seed, you got the good temperature, you got uh, airflow, they got plenty of moisture, they're covered with a light, light layer of soil, quarter of an inch of fluffy soil, then um, have no fear. They will sprout. It'll just take, they should be sprouting any time. So yeah, that'll work. But see, they can't, they can't get, um, okay, let's see. McKenzie says, I was surprised about the soaking wet soil for the onions, but I'm going to try it. Well, uh, I just mean pre-moisten the soil. I don't mean like really soaking wet. I guess it's soaking wet, but yeah, if you add that and then add the onions, I like to pre-moisten a lot of the soil just because it, uh, then you don't have to water on top of it and the seeds float to the top and all of that stuff. So I pre-moisten a lot of the soil. Um, Joe says, I'm getting my onions started right after your video. Yes, guys, check out the onion video if you have not already. Okay. Um, uh, so mom says, you have trolls in here that are, mom computer says, uh, you have trolls in here that are very distracting and fill the chat with BS. Please consider getting mods that can remove and block them. Absolutely, I'm going to, yes. Um, that is going to uh, happen very soon because that is absolutely distracting, yes. Although I'm not that distracted by it right now. But it makes it pointless because people like to read the chat, you know, so it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I can try and uh, let's see here. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Well, I say it went to user's message will be hidden. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if we actually can do that. Okay. User's message. Okay. Well, we'll see. It says user's message can be hidden. So we'll see. Um, 
now where else are we see see what a just a, a waste of time okay joe says joe paduzzi says manure is so risky where i live uh even if the animals are organic i'm afraid the bedding their manure is on may not be straw is especially risky yeah i know i know it can be like that it can be like that which is not good i mean it's a tragedy that the oldest form of soil fertility that humankind has had humans and, and animals have coexisted with agriculture for many thousands of years and uh the fact that we can't use the most i mean the, the fertilizer we've been using since the dawn of agriculture is sad very sad and indicative of obviously many things in our culture but uh yeah i don't know what to say about that uh, the number of times though you just have to take the risk you just have to take the gamble and do a small plot you know and uh that's what you got to do my man says uh my friend sells doTERRA and swears by it oh i love doTERRA man big time so uh what is the best way to get rid of grass and weeds out of an established asparagus patch Whew, tough one i don't know i would say when they're in dormancy uh tarp it, it would be the best way I, I would say either tarp it or burn it take the weed torch but when they're in dormancy when they're cut to the ground below ground then take the weed torch and burn the uh the grasses or uh tarp it uh, yeah i've never had to do that though i mean i know how asparagus grows and stuff i know it's life cycle but i've never had to remove weeds from an asparagus patch so if any of you guys have friends that uh or if any of you guys are doing that let them know a way to do it but i would say when they're in dormancy either torch it or tarp it <clears throat> now um Let's see. Roverino says your uploads after the live event most of the time don't show the chats. Is that on purpose because of the spammers? No, that's because I had a setting that was wrong for some time. It shows 24 hours after the thing uploads. So I, I had a setting that was wrong. But now that I'm scheduling them in advance, I figured out how to schedule them in advance. And, uh, and then, uh, yes, I, I uh, can make it so that they can all be seen now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's what trolls do. Waste everyone time. Yes, busy girl. I agree. I mean, what a waste of time. But also, you know, uh, yeah, we just, we have trolls all over the place on the internet in our day to day life. And it's a skill to, I mean, I'm already way more focused when the troll is saying stuff now, psh, you know, but that being said, it's not pleasant. I mean, what n nobody likes, you know, just get out, get out, you know, uh, mom computer says double A and Rhonda, please. Keep offering until Nate sees you. Thank you for volunteering. Are you talking about uh, for to be moderator? Uh, that would be great. I, I will have to see how to do. You know, I will have to see how to do that. I'm not super tech savvy, guys, but I, I can see how if I can make someone a moderator, then I absolutely will. Um, and Double A, I remember you from a long time, so that that would be. Um, Becky says, I think you all block the trolls. Nobody will see them. Okay. Good. Mr. Tablet Man says, hey, Nate, quick question on the master cleanse. I'm starting end of the month. Can I drink water in between lemonades or is it strictly just lemons? Thankfully, I'm making a whole new master cleanse series. Me and Jenny yesterday just formed because she's on the master cleanse right now. She's on day three or four. And uh, I filmed a bunch of new footage. And so I'm going to make a whole new series of master cleanse videos on my other channel, Nate Murray. And uh, but short answer is yes. And uh, you can drink water throughout, but the thing is that you want to make sure you're getting plenty of lemonades. Most people will quench their thirst with the water and not drink enough lemonades, and that's when they have the problems. Remember, it's a cleanse and not a fast, so you have to drink more of the cleansing mixture to cleanse the body. So, uh, yeah, you can drink some water if you need to, no problem. I want to tell you guys <clears throat> the new um, things that... Uh, oh, uh, um, Mish recommended a seed company for me. Uh, to look at uf seeds u and then f and then seeds.com and uh turns out they are based in indiana which is super cool so uh they're in like Greencastle or greenfield one of the two and uh yeah so guys check them out because i was looking at their stuff and actually i think i'm gonna order some german butterball potatoes from them maybe i shouldn't even say this because i don't want them to sell out because it's hard to find german butterballs but these are the ones I don't tell you guys in the videos, but that I'm growing, you know, but German butter bowls are divine. They just, they never last until the following season, not because they won't store, but because I eat every single one of them. 
uh, because they are so delicious. They're small, they store really well, and they taste, they have the consistency of butter, literally. So they're dense. Think of like classic German potato salad, you know what I'm talking about? Where, where the real dense potatoes, that's what these that would be used for. Uh, and the ufseeds.com has them. They're on pre-order, you have to pre-order them. They don't ship until the time is right. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna order like 20 pounds of them. Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to, to do that because even though I use Baker Creek and stuff like that, you know, I also use true leaf. If I get any seeds in bulk, like cover crops or, um, wheatgrass seeds or sprouting seeds or, um, um, uh, microgreen seeds, then I get it from true leaf market. And I put links in the description to all that stuff. If you guys also want to do the same, um, now <clears throat> here's some other things that didn't go into the what I'm growing video. Okay. Uh, one is I reordered some Cracker Jack marigolds because, uh, I'm thinking that, and tell me if, if this is correct, you guys that grow flowers and marigolds, uh, I think that the marigolds cross pollinate with each other because I have a, I grow a number of different kinds because of how wonderful the, uh, the pest repellent effect is and how hardy they are. But the orange Hawaii sort of mix with the dwarf sort of mix with the Cracker Jack. And now the seeds that I plant the next year are just off. They, they really... They, they grow good, but they don't have the same characteristics. I think they're crossbreeding, so I'm gonna find out for sure this year because I love the Cracker Jack Marigold. Uh, guys, I'm trying this Aunt Molly's ground cherry this year. The ground cherries are divine, delicious. This one says, Polish heirloom variety has unusually fine flavor. Very sweet with a nice hint of tartness. Excellent choice for pies and preserves. Now the ground cherry is one of the only like annual fruit type things that we can grow. It's in the tomato family. <clears throat> and last year I grew them, I grew the Cusacks, the group, the Cusacks, um, ground cherry last year. So that one was awesome. I'm going to plant more. I'm also going to plant these, um, Aunt Molly's and I'm going to see, cause I love the sweetness of the ground cherries. Purple hole, pink eyed peas. I'm growing them this year because, uh, I've got that pea shelling machine. And uh, apparently these taste like peas and these are really nice. Uh, so I really got, they grow these in the South where it's really hot. And so I got big plan, I got big hopes for these. They're peas, they call them peas, but they're cow peas. They're black eyed peas basically. So we'll see, uh, that's gonna be a new one. <clears throat> so yes, Chris Black says, in my area, so hard to get fruit, I'm in 4B. Absolutely. That is why, and it's hard to get fruit in a fresh, newly started garden. It takes multiple years, but ground cherries are the closest thing to an annual fruit. So you can plant the ground cherry. It's, it's just, it's like a tomatillo, but, uh, they take, uh, you have to wait until they're fully ripe. When they're fully ripe, they fall off the plant onto the ground. That's why they're called ground cherries. They have a little husk around them and, uh, they'll fall off the plant and they'll stay good for a couple of days in that husk. You just take them and, oh man, just like pineapple mixed with um, a little bit of black or a little bit of currant flavored. The, yeah, if you like fruit, but you can't grow fruit trees or you don't have the time to grow fruit bushes and stuff and you want uh, fruit flavored produce the first year, grow the ground cherry, guys. Okay, PA says... I want to try those Tahitian squash y'all talk about, but I can't find them on European sites. Anyone know if they go by another name? Uh, I think Baker Creek will ship internationally. So um, they go by Tahitian melon squash. That's it. Yeah. So uh, Jason says, I heard about the ground cherry this year. How big is the plant? Would a 20 gallon pot be okay size? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. 20 gallon would be, would be a good size. They get, um, you know, mine got uh, the size of a small indeterminate tomato plant or a small determinate tomato plant. So, you know, they, they get about four feet across and about four feet high. They can get that big, but I've seen them also that are much smaller. So, um, but they can get actually bigger than that even. This year, I know I'm going to get them to be as big as they can genetically get. Uh, cause I'm doing, I'm really giving them last year. They were an afterthought. I planted two plants, put a cage around them, never touched them again. And I, but until mid season, I was like, Whoa, these are going to be, I'm paying much more attention to them this year, giving them the nice manure, the JMS, the, the spa treatment, you know, they're going to grow real well this year. 
So uh, <clears throat> a couple of more things. The Lincoln P, um, I'm trying this year. I, I think I've grown this one before, but we'll see, because I got that P shelling machine. So if you watch my other video of the, the varieties of stuff I'm growing, um, I grow the Tall Telephone, which is a great one. Nice and tall, uh, vigorous producer, boatloads of peas. And the, but uh, this should be similar, so we'll see. Because you always gotta experiment. That's how I know what's good and what's not. Uh, again, I'm growing the Painted Mountain, guys. This is a wonderful uh, dry corn, a flint corn, that you can uh, grow these. They grow, they're good for short seasons because they only get about four to five feet tall, which means that they don't spend so much time creating the infrastructure of the seven or eight or nine foot tall corn like the glass gem. My glass gems get like nine feet tall. These only get four to five feet and uh, they will produce these beautiful ears and you can grind this, you can just dry it, let it dry on the, on the cob and then uh, put it into the Vitamixer, that's all I do. And then grind it up into a powder, like a meal, a corn meal. And then I make grits with it, I can make Johnny cakes with it, I eat it all winter long. I'm out now because I didn't grow enough last year. But uh, yeah, super good seeds. Then of course the Weathersfield Red, I just ordered another thing just in case, you know, cause even though I planted them all, um, this is a new one to me this year, carbon, because people claim that it tastes better than the Cherokee purple plant. I mean, I know that's, that's crazy talk. That's totally ludicrous. Uh, and I don't believe it, but anyone that makes such an outlandish claim, I'm willing to give them a shot. So, uh, this tomato claims the winner of the 2005 heirloom garden show best tasting tomato award, smooth, large, beautiful fruit. They have more of that complex flavor that makes purple fam uh, tomatoes famous. So we'll see. I'm growing that one this year. But I doubt anything can compete with the Cherokee purple. Um, also, I'm growing the Avarsky pepper. Ivarsky pepper. Because I want to make... Uh, these are some good roasting peppers. Macedonian roasting peppers. So, okay. Uh, at Nate, when you shell the purple hull peas, save them, the hulls. And you can make jellies with them. It is supposed to taste like grapes. What? That's the first I've heard of that. I've got a, a shelling machine that I just run them through, and it drops them all underneath. It's really good. <coughs> okay. Um, Nate, what are your opinion on cold, hardy kiwi? I'm definitely gonna try it when I get some land, but I have never tried it and never tasted them, never grown them, I don't know. Very interesting though, if you have the opportunity, definitely grow them and let me know how it goes, okay? Um, <clears throat> guys, and this is an off topic question, but uh, do you, any of you guys out there, do you use an electric shaver for your beard or for, for your face? Because I'm about to be shaving this whole thing off, you know? And uh, I don't like to scrape the face with the razor. I just don't like that kind of feeling. I don't feel like it's good for the skin. Uh, so I wanna try this this time like like an electric shaver that can get really close, like a good, you know, a good shave. Uh, so do you guys use any of those kind of electric shavers and are you so happy with yours that you could recommend one to me or at least so that I can investigate into it? So you can put it in the comments, you know, um, and let me know. That would be helpful, thank you. And um, let's see, Larry says, we are doing the evil olive tomato this year are the size of cherry tomatoes. Evil olive, okay. Evil spelled backwards is live or live, so they must be good. Um, can you post a link to your shelling machine? Yes, I can. Well, you can just look it up because I, I'm not promoting them yet because I haven't fully, you know, I just got it last year and I, it took me a while to learn. I was really dismayed at first. It wasn't working like I thought, but then after enough practice, I just kept going for it. And after enough practice, um, I got the system down. And once I got the system down, whoa, okay. I was like, all right, now that now I did a whole, like, um, half of a five gallon bucket of shelled peas. I'm talking, you know, multiple five gallon buckets in the shell and I ran them through the sheller and got a half a half of a, of a five gallon bucket full of peas in about an hour. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible because otherwise that would not have happened. I just would not sit there and shell the peas. You know, it's, I don't have eight kids that is, you know, shelling peas and stuff. Uh, so there's just no way I would have done that. So the machine is a game changer, but 
it's not for everyone, so I'm, I'm not really promoting them yet, but if you wanna look it up, it's called the Taylor P. Scheller, uh, Taylor Manufacturing. They're, they've been made the same way for like 50 years. It's totally industrial grade. It's expensive though, I warn you. It's, a, it's good if you got several people that can go in together on it. They're like 700 bucks. Uh, if you got several people that can go in together on it, then uh, you can all use it to shell your peas or, or beans. It also does beans as well. So that's why I'm, you know, that's another reason I got it. Uh, and they're totally heirloom quality. I mean, you'll be passing it down to you. They're industrial. It's a piece of farm machinery, basically. It's about this big. It's about 30 pounds. And uh, yeah, that's the real deal. So um, Graham, what's up, my buddy? He says, Hi, Nate. Razors are poisonous. The gel strip before the blade has toxins added to it. We aren't meant to shave right to the skin. A Turkish shave with the razor knife is about the best if it is done right. Dude, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. That's why I haven't, I have not scraped my skin with a razor in years. I mean, there's just no way. I don't, uh, I don't, because intuitively I can just tell this is not, no, this is not what natural man is doing. It's supposed to be doing, you know, but I, I would like to have a, a time with a, uh, you know, maybe I'll just continue using my clippers. You know, I just use the clippers and it gets close enough. I mean, there's still stubble and stuff, but you know, I'm just curious if you guys, what you guys use. What do you use, Graham? I assume that you uh, chafe. So uh, let's see. Glassback says, the good thing about that Taylor P. Sheller is they sell the rollers as spares. The rest of the machine looks pretty easy to make. So are you looking at it or do you have one? Do you have, you have experience with it? But yeah, they sell all the parts that you need. And also with the P. Sheller guys, and I'll do a whole video on this at some point this summer, um, shaving is a man assault. I like that. Uh, but I'll do a whole video on it. And a big thing is that because with stuff like that, I always look about, okay, well, the grid is here and that's fine. But after you live without the grid for a number of years, like I did in Northern California, you, it, you never go back. It's never the same. So you're always thinking, okay, well, that's fine. So long as there's the grid, but what about when there's no grid? What about when there's no electricity? Okay. Uh, so that's what I think of. And so I would never have gotten that P shelling device if it depended hundred percent on electricity, but it's got external pulleys on it with a, a, a full, um, with a belt and stuff. So absolutely we could hook up a bike type machine and uh, take the, the belt off and power it by bicycle. Absolutely. One person would be pedaling the bike, the other person feeding it through, it would work that way. So that was also a big selling point. Although they don't advertise that, but I can just tell by looking at it that we could do that. So um, go to a spa, Nate, you have earned a treat. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, I only, sh Jason says, I only shave for court. Yeah, really? Well, it's been, thankfully it's been many years since all that stuff, that, that life is behind me. No more court dates. Uh, Marcus says, I'm Asian. <laughs> you guys shave? Yeah, yeah, we shave sometimes. Um, let's see. Use larger clipper to start any brand and finish with one blade by Phillips Norelco. Brings it down very close and very maneuverable. Great for edging. Okay, one blade by Norelco. I'll check that out. Thank you. Uh, one blade. I need to. Our ancestors have been using blades to shave for thousands of years with fantastically smooth results. You think so, Ben? I mean, I wouldn't say that's not true. You know, I just, I don't know. I'm, I would assume it probably is, but it's just so much easier to have, to have a beard. But uh, one blade, one blade. But yeah, I will absolutely not be able to carry this thing around all summer. So as soon as it starts to warm up, it's going. And you guys will be like, whoa, you, you, you. like, who are you? It looked totally different. Uh, but I like that. I like that contrast. That's why I'm letting it get all mangy, you know, because then you shave and it's like all refreshing. Ah, I feel so young. Ah, yeah. Um... Let's see. So there's absolutely no electric shavers. <laughs> there's no electric shavers found in nature. Well, I would agree with that. So, uh, okay. Blue. I was going to say that. Go for the wax, Nate. Oh yeah, definitely. If I go into a spa, yeah. Can you guys give me the, can I get this waxed off? Would you mind waxing this? Rip. Oh, that'd be miserable. Not, not a chance. 
Uh, try a safety razor. The blades are very, very sharp. Doesn't scrape your face. Very clean shave. That's actually what I used to use is the safety razor. The old school where you screw it up and the, the heavy stainless. Yeah. And that's what I would go back to if I needed to do that. Um, but I'm just looking for other alternatives. You know, if there was one, if there was an electric one that could bring it down, you know, um, but yeah, sounds like an episode of Gilligan's Island. Ha! <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And let's see here. Okay, guys. Well, we're getting towards the end. So if you have any burning questions, let me know. Okay. Um, I can't cope with inching after like two weeks. So the dog clippers come out. Oh, yeah. Oh, the itching. Yeah, it gets to a point, though, where it doesn't itch anymore. You know, and I just put um, a little bit of cedar wood oil and um, olive oil. So cedar wood, one drop of cedar wood and uh, a, a dropper full of olive olive oil and just go like this oh man it, this is so soft i mean this is super soft try your f skills at flint or obsidian blades yes i actually do flint napping obsidian napping and stuff uh or used to yeah don't forget the like button guys i would appreciate that okay um let's see joe says marcus my five brother-in-laws are asian we stayed in the same house for a week i had to shave five times before they had to shave once yeah, it's not really part of the culture. Uh, th that's one reason when I was traveling and stuff, I stuck out really like a what, you know, in, a in Asia especially. And I, yeah, I just really stuck out in Asia. So, okay, uh, let's see here. Another thing, oh, I did say I was going to say something about the sea salt. And uh, yeah, sea salt is very beneficial for the garden, but only in small amounts, okay? So we will utilize it in the JMS. So you have no concern. I got a question about it. Yeah, there's no concern about the sea salt so long as you are using it uh, in the JMS solution at the right dosages, okay? Uh, because sea salt has 82 different minerals in it and every one of them is vital to the growth of plant tissue and human tissue and the sustaining of life. So, uh, but the good and the bad are the same thing. They're opposite ends of the same thing. And so too much of the good thing will become a bad thing. So we must utilize it properly by following the instructions in the um, video that I made. Okay. So uh, let's see. Apologize, apologies if you already answered as I was away for a bit. But how do we make soil acidic for my lemon and mandarin plants in containers? Uh, I would say you don't really need to do that. You need to make the because it's not the soil being acidic that makes the difference. It is the microorganisms and the roots of the plant that create the acidity that, so when, when we say that a plant likes acidic soil, what we're actually saying, and we, most people don't know it, is that they're saying that the soil that these plants grow in tests as acidic. And so they like acidic soil, but they make the soil acidic. So through microorganism activity, that's the thing. Most people think that pine needles will make the soil acidic, but because the area around pine trees and pine needles is acidic, but it's actually the relationship of the microorganisms in the roots that create the acidic nature that the plant needs. So your best bet is to make sure that there's thriving amount of microorganisms. So add the JMS from your locally captured microorganisms, the indigenous microorganisms. Okay. Uh, add that with plenty of organic matter and the plant will be able to adjust the pH to exactly what it needs, no problem. Yeah. So, okay, guys, uh, let's see. I use rock salt in my JMS. I guess it's fossilized sea salt. So, same. Um, I don't know about that. I would definitely use sea salt. I mean, Himalayan salt is sea salt. It, it came from the sea. It just evaporated millions of years ago. Um, so, rock salt, though, I think has been really processed. But... I'm not sure exactly. I'd have to see which one you're talking about, guys. So, um, and thanks for sharing with us. You're an inspiration. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Blue Wolf. Uh, Shalma says, sorry, but what is JMS? Jadam Microbial Solution. Please watch the video that I just made um, about apply this five times before planting and make that solution. But if you have plants in the ground, always remember, if there's plants in the ground, you have to dilute it one part Microbial solution with 20 parts of water, okay? Don't go any stronger than that. But if there's no plants in the ground yet, there's no living roots, then you can put it full strength 
or one to one or one to five or one to 10, whatever you want, but uh, apply that, okay? So, uh, okay, my friends. So thank you very much. We will be back here at the same time, same place. So if you have any questions, you can um, put them in the comments. I try to do, uh, I try to answer all the questions in the comments, but uh, there's becoming a lot of them now, which is great. But uh, so don't take it personally if I can't get back to every single one. Um, Diametri, hello. She says we're making the JMS uh, for the first time today. Nice. Good job. So, uh, yeah, watch the video that I just made on when to tell when it's at the peak. Okay. Um, I can turn it with heavy metals. Okay, guys. We'll be back at the same time, same place. Thank you.